Um, I think we're, do we have, if Maria's testifying, I can't hear her. I can't either. You can't hear me at all? Now, now we can. Now, now we, can. we can. Oh, oh, great. Okay. Um, and how about, can you see the presentation now? Yes. yes. Okay. And it's on full screen mode? Yes. Terrific. Okay, um, so Maria Royal with Legislative Council. Um, nice to see you all. And as Senator Kitchell just said, I'm gonna be talking about broadband and uh, the funding that's available in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And the way I'm going to proceed is um, just give a very quick overview of prior federal funding for broadband and how the state used that money, really brief overview. It's actually only going to take up one slide of my presentation, but just to remind you, refresh your memory of some of the steps that you've taken so far with federal funds that have been available. And then I'll go through uh, the specific money that's going to be available through the Infrastructure Act. And just again, kind of setting the context in terms of that new funding, there are really three categories that broadband funding falls into deployment, which is actually construction of broadband facilities, um, digital equity, which is making sure that all individuals have access to, to broadband, have the devices and equipment that are necessary and the skills to use um, of the internet. And then finally, affordability, uh, that there are affordable options available. And that's gonna be addressed primarily in the form of a subsidy that's available to consumers. So that's an overview of what I'm gonna be presenting today. And this is the one slide um, that's gonna deal with the prior pandemic funding. Um, again, just to refresh your memories. Uh, obviously we still the just, have the, we just have the cover slide. Have you moved to a second one? I have. Um, We just have the first slide broadband, you know, prepared by. If you've moved to it, oh, okay. Now we've now we've uh, got it. Thank you. Maria, Maria, you yeah. also might want to turn off your screen for can you do it for your um you keep freezing is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so maybe I'll stop my video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that might help. Um, so right now, are you looking at prior pandemic funding? We're looking at table of contents. Oh, uh, we lost her. I think so. I think we may have to just um, not screen share. Yeah. Does Maria know? Uh, I can give her a call. That was okay. me, so I just checked my. Oh. But. I think Maria's back. Yeah, I am back. I'm really sorry. Um, I don't have a great broadband connection. Um, maybe the best thing to do, Chrissy. Maybe I can I can call in, and Chrissy might be able to move through the slides. Is that, or we can just try again? Um, either that, or we can um, just. Oh, Chrissy, can you help us with this? Or um, otherwise we can just lis listen to you, um, go through it and we can maybe look at it. I, I, we've got it now, table of contents. Um, now we have the prior funding. So do you wanna start there, Maria? We're on yeah, that slide. I'm really sorry. Let's keep our fingers crossed. It works from, from now on. Um, okay. 
So just to quickly review, uh, the CARES Act uh, through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, um, Vermont appropriated about $17.4 million for broadband. And you'll remember there was the initial one year deadline, so a pretty tight time frame to actually do large scale broadband construction projects that ultimately was extended by another year. But you did things like line extensions, um, assistance to consumers for their costs of, of line extensions. You had a temporary broadband subsidy that you put into place and you also um, appropriated money for recovery planning related to broadband projects. Um, then there was the Consolidated Appropriations Act in December of 2020, a year ago. Um, there was a new federal program, uh, the Broadband Infrastructure Program. And there was also the creation of a new federal subsidy, temporary subsidy um, available to consumers for broadband services, the emergency broadband benefit. And I'm just highlighting that a little bit because there's new federal funding funding to make this now a permanent program. So there will be a permanent broadband subsidy available to consumers. And we'll talk about that um, later on in the presentation. And then the big, biggest um, pot of money for the state was through ARPA. You appropriated last year $150 million um, in Vermont. And that money went into the Vermont Community Broadband Fund to be distributed by the new board, the five member board that you created. Um, and that is for everything from pre-construction expenses to construction expenses and planning and facilitating primarily CUDs and small, either working alone or in partnership with an ISP and also the smaller um, telecom providers in the state. So that work is underway. Um, Christine Hallquist is the executive director of the board um, and no doubt you'll be getting an update on where they are soon. I'm also just mentioning, uh, you're familiar with under ARPA, the Capital Projects Fund that will result in about $113 million coming to Vermont. Broadband is an eligible expense, um, but obviously you're gonna have lots of demands on that funding, but I just wanted to highlight it. Um, here. So are you now looking at the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act slide? Yes, uh -huh. we are. So with respect to broadband, one of the findings, um, there are a number of findings in the act, um, but probably I think one of the most significant ones I've quoted here, access to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband is essential to full participation in modern life in the United States. And that provides kind of the foundation for all of the programs that are then created and funded through this act. The total funding for broadband specifically is $65 billion nationally. And again, that funding goes through three categories, deployment, digital equity, and affordability. And we're gonna start um, looking at the deployment funding streams first. So there are about um, four kind of fun financing funding streams for deployment. And we're gonna look at each one of these as well um, in greater detail. But just to kind of, um, uh, again, pro provide context and make sure we're all familiar with the terms most of the money, about $42 billion of that $65 billion goes into a program designed to fund last mile infrastructure. By last mile, these are the connections that go right to the house, to the end user, right? That's in distinction um, to middle mile infrastructure, which are kind of the ma major transmission lines um, that connect towns, states, et cetera, but consumers don't hook up to middle mile. This is for the providers to connect their various networks. So there's funding, most of it for last mile, some funding for middle mile. And then in addition, there are appropriations to existing programs. And we'll talk about those. Those are programs through the Rural Utility Service in the oh. 
Oh no, we've lost you. Oh. Hmm. Looks like our whole system went down. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> hmm. And we were talking about the importance of broadband and internet. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, Maria, Maria must be up here in the kingdom or something. <laughs> I don't you know. One of those last mile connections. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. She's um, in Washington Village area, I think. I did notice um, while we get her back on, Washington Electric um, newsletter had talked about the bond, uh, how, how they would use the uh, um, low interest funding that's available to utilities sure. and how it would work. So it's interesting. We passed legislation that would member permit that, and um, yep. um, I was I don't know whether other utilities have um, have proposals underway, but obviously Washington Electric is uh, right out there uh, uh, proposing to use that funding stream to get uh, um, to expand broadband access to their customers, which frankly they need to manage electrical consumption. You know, yep. with um, EVs or appliances or heating or whatever. So, Maria, do we have you back? No. Yes, you do. Oh, okay. Well, we're back to broadband deployment slot slide. Sounds like you were doing a great job, actually. <laughs> and maybe you moved on. Were you at, so? So we went. I don't have to spend a lot of time on the slide because we're going to get to more of the details, but there is financing through bonds, there's some workforce development initiatives, not funding, but studies, and then there's some funding not included in that $65 billion, but specifically for electric grid modernization that might be able to use for broadband projects as well. So in terms of the last mile infrastructure, the program that you'll hear the most about or that 42, approximately $42 billion is going into is called the BEAD program, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. The, this is a program that's gonna be administered, well, the money's gonna to flow to the states, which will apply for the funding and then can subgrant the funds within their states. But the program, the parameters have been set by the Infrastructure Act but it's gonna be administered by the NTIA, which is part of the Department of Commerce. So that federal agency has six months to establish the program. Money's not yet available. Um, the rules uh, are being promulgated, worked on now. And once the details of the program have been um, created, then the NTIA will um, issue a notice of funding opportunity at which point the state can then apply. What we do know is based on a formula, Vermont will receive at least $100 million for broadband. Um, there will be some additional funds uh, that will be distributed to states based on basically the number of unserved locations they have uh, in high cost areas more specifically. One um, of Maria. Maria, one of the um, concerns has been how, um, what were the federal standards for defining underserved? And that would seem to be a very low bar. Did that yes. get changed? So we are, we'll actually get to that and talk a little bit about, but oh. basically you are considered unserved if you're below 25.3. So if you don't have broadband service at um, the, meets or exceeds 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload, you are considered unserved. The underserved, the money can also be used for underserved locations. And that's a little bit higher threshold as you would expect. And that is 120. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about the program requirements with respect to those details. Um, but the other, the other thing I just wanted to note here in terms of identifying those locations, Vermont has really has a great um, broadband map um, by 911 location. 
um, with extremely helpful data. That has not been the case at the federal level, level with the federal maps. And so there has been a lot of funding and work done to update um, the federal broadband maps. However, that work is ongoing. And the la latest I heard is that those maps, which are gonna define the locations, all of this is necessary before the funds can go out the door, might not be available to 2023. Um, so that's just something to kind of highlight to think about the timing of all of this, um, but that's a contingency that's out of the state's control. And then finally, these funds are intended to supplement, not supplant uh, existing state and federal funding. Um, so then, and this center Kitchell is getting to kind of greater specificity. I think what you're looking at is once the state receives the money, um, as I said, it can competitively uh, award sub grants um, and the areas that it is going to be looking at are the unserved 25-3 and the underserved. In addition, the money is available to connect, connect community anchor institutions so these might be like hospitals, health centers, schools, libraries, and uh, it would require bringing gigabit service, symmetrical gigabit service to those entities. So funding can be used for that purpose as well. And then there's also uh, funding available for data collection, mapping, planning, et cetera. Um, there also can be funding for installations of reduced cost broadband within multifamily residential buildings. Um, funding can be used for broadband adoption um, to help uh, individuals um, acquire devices, laptops, tablets, et cetera, and any other use uh, determined by the NTIA. In terms of additional priorities and um, requirements of the program, obviously uh, first the unserved are considered a priority, then the underserved, then the community anchor institutions. In terms of who would be eligible for subgrants, um, there is a specific requirement um, that you'll see in that bullet too, the list of entities that may not be excluded. So the funding uh, needs to be open to cooperatives, nonprofits, private entities, in addition to local governments. Um, obviously, Vermont has um, spent a great deal of time um, serving high cost rural areas through their CUDs. Um, but there is a requirement here that the eligibility be broader, at least in terms of um, the, the federal law. And then in terms of additional priorities for broadband projects, projects that serve um, counties that have persistent poverty or high poverty rates, um, the uh, NTIA will also be looking at speeds of a proposed service. The faster the speed, the greater weight that would carry the completion data, that's construction completion, like how, how long it would take to build the products. Um, and then compliance with uh, federal labor and employment laws. There is a matching requirement of 25% for these broadband projects, except in high cost areas. But in terms of meeting that matching requirement, you can use in-kind contributions. You can also use prior uh, federal uh, funding for broadband. So to the extent you have other funding available, you can use that to meet the matching requirement. So would ARPA be a a permissible? I believe so. Okay. I believe so. It's just so. like uh, we could use the CRF for matching. I believe so. I, I will confirm that, but it's written pretty broadly, but. All right, all right. Because obviously matching, if we have a variety of different areas all requiring matching could add up to yes. um, a significant uh, in total. All right. Yeah. So then in terms of what would be built with this funding, the service requirements. So the provider would have to um, provide or at least offer 120 um, service to each location in the service territory that wants it. Um, there is 
a latency requirement. Uh, this is not bandwidth. This is the amount of time it takes for data to load, to upload and download. And the federal law specifies that that latency must be sufficiently low to allow reasonably foreseeable uh, real-time interactive applications. So Maria, you spent a lot of time next door in Senate finance and they've talked about um, um, the standards. Is 120 and um, 20, uh, is, is that consistent with what they have well, talked so about? <laughs> I'm really glad you asked that question. And this is, this is really interesting and it'll be interesting to learn what kind of latitude the state has. So what you have been funding with ARPA um, is service that meets 100, 100. Okay, all right, that's what I was thinking that that was. So, and right now that's really fiber. Mm -hmm. So that's where your efforts have been going. Um, I think there may be a few um, exceptions. Um, I'm trying to remember now if in the, in the latest law, well, you did have some exceptions, but really you've been looking at funding um, 100, 100 service. So the way the federal law is written, you have to provide at least 120. That doesn't necessarily mean that the state can't, I don't think, um, can't require a higher threshold, but that's not really clear yet. That's okay. certainly something that the NTIA will, will be looking at and providing greater clarity. Um, Thank you. Yep, and then also, uh, with this funding, you have to offer, the provider has to offer at least one low-cost broadband service option. That's not defined yet, and that is something that the state will define um, uh, in consultation with working with the federal agency. And then finally, in terms of the time frame of construction, it must be completed within four years of receiving the subgrant. The money that went out, the $150 million of ARPA funds, I believe that all needs to be spent by the end of 2024. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here just in terms of the program, um, the process for applying for the grants, um, as well as some preparation that the state might be thinking about to uh, get ready, um, not only to apply for the grants, but also um, make some decisions about how you want the money to be subgranted. So the state will apply for a letter of intent, will submit a letter of intent with the federal agency. At that time, it can also request planning funds to create a five-year action plan. Um, subsequent to that, it will file an initial proposal for how it um, plans to expend the funds and then a final proposal. But there's a lot of, um, there are many provisions in the federal act that talk very specifically about what the NTIA is gonna be looking at for these plans. Um, what are the challenges and barriers uh, to build out? What kind of capacity does the state need? And that can be in terms of staffing uh, or workforce. Um, identifying obviously unserved and unserved locations. Again, Vermont is, in, is well positioned for that, um, and, but ensuring that we know where all the community anchor institutions are, um, and then you know, having the infrastructure, the governmental infrastructure to oversee and coordinate the various efforts. So these are things that you know, the state might be wanting, you might want to think about in terms of being prepared um, to apply for and then uh, expend the monies. So uh, that, Maria, one yep. of the things that um, I think um, I'm struggling with uh, is how, what is required here, how it aligns with what we have, because we spent a, quite a bit of time, and I think uh, Senator Brock was talking about like a 10-year, and that was a broader plan. I think it might have been a, you know, more inclusive um, uh, plan, and I think it was more like 300 thousand or something. Uh, and so I'm just, uh, when you're going through this, I'm like, how does this fit with what we already have sort of underway? Um, and so uh, to me, that's going to be a kind of a challenge because our memories um, get, a, well, I, maybe others are better than mine um, in terms of 
what did we fund? What did we finally put in place? How, what did we? How did we fund it? What were the parameters, and how does it align with this new uh, funding stream? So yes. and that that's my uh, one comment that's floating through um, uh, through my brain uh, around um, uh, alignment and or where we've got some disjuncture that we have to deal with. Yes, and I think some of that will depend on what the final rules are for the program. Mm -hmm latitude the state has. So if you can simply supplement what you've already set up, right, then you can just mm -hmm. continue to fund those projects that otherwise might not have been funded. Um, but what complicates this even a little bit more is in addition to the funding that you've allocated through ARPA and this new funding that's going to go through the state to subgrant. There are other federal programs such as RDOF and the Reconnect program that are mm -hmm. also funding unserved. So there is a real challenge in the area. There are about 50 federal broadband programs, I think. Um, but the big ones are RDOF, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, um, and now the Reconnect program, which Vermont is now eligible for trying to coordinate all of those programs and who is being funded and at what thresholds, I think is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. it's certainly, so it's, it's good to highlight that. And it's certainly something I'm gonna be looking at that I'm sure the, the board and the department are also um, you know, trying to identify locations that don't have a funded solution um, okay. mm -hmm. from any source. So in terms of middle mile- It's sort of a bit like Minoan architecture. You know, we add a program uh, sort of over time and it becomes very challenging to figure out to get from one place to another or how it all connects. So- Yes. Um, yes. Uh, well, the board I would think is well positioned as well as the department to, um, to help us with that. Because it, yep. it seems to me that's really essential, and Absolutely. and the same thing we're experiencing the same same thing with housing and you know money coming in and who's the population eligible and what are their parameters and in, et cetera. So it it it's it really does say, take some time to well first of all understand um, each of the funding uh, sources the rules et cetera to look at it in total. So, Absolutely. And I know, I think it was in November, the department um, gave a presentation before the Vermont Community Broadband Board where they presented maps and updated statistics where they're looking at just this issue that included the RDOF funding areas and everything. So I, it is absolutely something that's being looked at and trying to have better coordination information to help you make your decisions going forward. Um, in terms of middle mile infrastructure, there's about $1 billion of uh, Infrastructure Act money available. And this is a competitive grant program that's gonna be administered at the, uh, through the NTIA. So it's, this is money that does not come through the state as an applicant, but providers can submit applications. Um, and the purposes um, for which this money will be available is for middle mile that will help to reduce the cost of connecting unserved and underserved areas to the internet backbone, and also to promote resiliency. So if you can, if you have the middle mile infrastructure, you continue to build that out into more and more areas in Vermont, it will make it less costly to then reach the last mile. Um, and if you have multiple um, fiber routes available, um, then you have greater resiliency to the extent you have alternative network paths in the event that one line goes down. So those are kind of the purposes of that funding. I won't go over this uh, um, in too much detail, but this is money uh, available to Vermont providers and that they have five years um, basically to complete that construction. So again, needs to coordinate with other state efforts. So in terms of other programs that, um, not new programs, although there are some amendments, um, but programs that received funding under the Infrastructure Act, there are two USDA programs uh, available through their Rural Utility Service. 
the NT NTIA in the Department of Co Commerce and the RUS in the Department of Agriculture are the two primary um, funding sources in this act. The FCC also has um, authority to um, give money out for broadband deployment. So there are, it's a little bit confusing with uh, more than one federal entity with the same mission uh, to bring broadband to unserved areas. In any event, uh, the ReConnect program is a program uh, that's been around for a number of years. And so additional money has gone to this program. There are some new funding requirements. I think the one thing that I just wanted to note about the ReConnect program is in the past, um, Vermont has uh, been challenged. A lot of entities could not apply for the funding. And that is because they did not uh, provide grants to areas that already were served by a prior RUS grant or loan, more specifically a loan. And you'll recall that VTEL in 2010 got an award to build out a wireless service um, almost statewide. And so any other entity that wanted to apply for reconnect grants um, was unable to do so because it was presumed that that service, VTEL had a loan to serve basically the rest of the state. So that um, prohibition or limitation has um, been removed. That actually was removed um, in the Consolidated Appropriations Act, but that's, that's been a hurdle. And so that will no longer be a hurdle for Vermont entities that want to apply for uh, grants and loans through this program. So in terms of private activity bonds, just another means of financing broadband, broadband build out in Vermont, the internal revel, revenue code is amended and now broadband is an allowable use for qualified private activity bonds. Um, beginning in 2022, state and local governments can issue qualified private activity bonds to finance qualified broadband projects in rural areas. And in terms of the definition of what a qualified broadband project is for purposes of this financing, it means a census block group or groups in which 50% of households lack 25-3 service and the project will result in all locations in that group um, having access to 120 service. In terms of the act, this is not really funding that's available for the state, um, but just wanted to note that uh, the federal government obviously recognizes what you recognized in Vermont, and that is there is a workforce shortage in the telecommunications sector. Um, obviously with all of the money that's available for broadband build out, um, there are supply chain issues and there are also workforce issues of all the states at the same time trying to build out broadband in a fairly short amount of time. So this is just to highlight some of the reports that will be available um, to you um, that might, might ease some of those uh, limitations. This is, um, this is all federal at the federal level. This um, is all at the federal uh, level. I, you, you know, I was, um, the reason I'm asking is at a recent meeting at our, one of our uh, career and tech centers, um, the local, one of the people that's on the board of the Northeast Kingdom CUD um, said, we need workforce and can you put together a program? And, um, and cause obviously they've got students and um, what they were talking about is to set up programs, you have to have money, you have to have, uh, uh, in, you have to spend money on equipment and, you know, what, uh, uh, and other costs associated with setting up a new program. Um, and I was just wondering, is there any, um, within this, any um, available funding to uh, support the, the creation of the, these training programs um, within say our career technical education um, uh, uh, system? 
That's a great question. I have to look more closely to see, you know, so the workforce provisions here don't have appropriations with them for the state, but the bead program for last mile is pretty broad in terms of what the mm -hmm. money can be used for. So I will look to see if workforce development is something that the state um, can fund. Then there may be other sources too, um, education, um, you know, there may be other funding sources that could get at the same issue. Um, and well, it's, just, yeah. it's just something, obviously, this would be a great career path for a lot of the students that might be um, in uh, um, tech ed. And um, it's obviously a, one of the areas that we've got a workforce shortage. So I was, I was just thinking about that conversation, the request that came in from a board member of our CUD to the career center saying, couldn't you set up one of these programs? And, um, and what, but then you have to be realistic. What does it take um, to do right. that? Right. And you did um, last session, you had some funding for a pilot program through the Vermont Technical College. Um, so we, I can you know, get an update on where things, things stand there. And you also appropriated um, some money to the Department of Labor to look more at the telecom workforce issues and what funding opportunities might, yeah. what the needs are and what funding might be available. So. Well, can, this, was, this yeah. was taking a request that came from the CUD yes. to a local CTE saying, it seems like this would be a logical connection um, yes. to make. And, um, and I, you know, I know that we've got language all over the place around workforce shortage, whether we're talking about healthcare careers, whether we're talking about weatherization, whether we're talking about, you know, broadband, et cetera. Um, so, um, but we've got to think about how we grow that capacity um, and um, give the, the training that, um, uh, in this case, students, but they could be adults as well. These uh, CTEs serve adults as well um, as, um, uh, as something that would be uh, another potential um, uh, way of training the workforce. I, I, you mentioned VTC, but this would be, um, right. you know, at, uh, at, at the CTEs as well. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. So then, so again, um, let me back up a little bit. So there is funny, not, this is not part of the $65 billion specifically for broadband. There is funding though um, for a number of energy as you know, climate change projects, but specifically for electric grid modernization, uh, $3 billion for the smart grid investment matching grant program. So this is a program that was created in 2007. Um, Vermont Utilities as part of the ERA funding received a significant amount of money through the Smart Grid Investment Matching Grant Program. And, and much of that funding I believe was used uh, to fund the purchase and installation of smart meters, for example. So some of this funding of the 3 billion nationally um, that might be available to electric companies may be used to enhance their communications infrastructure as they seek to better um, develop their grid management systems, et cetera. So I wanted to at least highlight that uh, something um, that may be another source that will impact. Well, let, me, let me ask another connecting point. Um, Senator Westman, Senator Starr, um, and I, uh, there was a presentation from the Vermont Public uh, Power Supply Authority um, in which they identified projects and what the projected costs would be. And, and some of them are um, advancing uh, the infrastructure for smart meters, um, uh, customer portals, um, et cetera. So um, then they wanted to get, but the big chunk was advanced metering infrastructure. Um, for projected, um, projected costs for their memberships, which are the small, more municipal, like Johnson, like um, Lindenville, um, Orleans, et cetera. 
And that was a $12 million price tag. And I, I did send that request out to the committee. Um, is this, is this, uh, I'm just trying to connect that request with this potential funding source. Is um, that absolutely. This could be a potential source of funding uh, that they might want to apply for. They would apply directly to the federal program. Okay. Um, but I do have the link there you'll see in blue. Um, uh -huh. And that is describes what are eligible costs. So I would be happy to share that information with the authority um, and also look more closely and see if it is something that they're considering. Okay, if you would be willing to do that, I mean, I, I, you must know the right person to um, connect with. Yep, um, I will do that. Uh, Senator Starr, Senator Westman, do you remember the, um, the names? Uh, of the person who um, organized our meeting. Oh. I'll find out, I'll find out. Okay, all right, all right. No problem. Uh, it's just more, um, more um, it's just, it's not on the sheet and I can't, um, and I can't remember, I'm sorry. But no. anyway, it just seems like they've made a request and I, I'm trying to connect it with this and it might be a, a, a potential funding stream. So yes. um, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. Thank yep. you. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. So now moving on to uh, digital equity, uh, the Digital Equity Act, uh, as it's called, is part of the Infrastructure Act. But this funds things like digital equity, inclusion, and literacy. Um, so making sure that all populations are um, have access to IT and technologies that are affordable and they have the skills to use them, basically. And the programs, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, the specific programs, um, target specific covered populations. And you can see those um, listed here. And I, I won't read through all of them just in the interest of time. Uh, but in terms then of the specific programs to promote equity, inclusion, and skills, there, these are basically uh, three sequenced programs. So first, there's the State Digital Equity Planning Grant Program. This is money available specifically to the states. The governor is gonna select the administering entity and they're gonna receive funds to develop plans to how to make sure um, everyone is included with access to and use of the internet. <clears throat> then there's the state digital equity capacity grant program was basically for implementation of those plans. And I believe Vermont will receive approximately $7.5 million for that for the implementation of the digital equity plan. The third program, the digital equity competitive grant program is a program that's open to uh, any entity that has uh, an equity project. So that can be a municipality, um, an ISP, nonprofits, schools, et cetera. So these are funding streams that are available specifically for digital equity purposes. Maria, to go back, and then, the person, uh, um, yeah. Maria, the person that we were um, coordinated the meeting with area legislators here was Melissa Bailey. Oh, okay, great. I know Melissa, okay. happy to give her a call. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. So the final kind of big uh, funding stream related to broadband relates to affordability. There is $14.2 billion available for what is basically a new program, a permanent program called the Affordable Connectivity Program. You'll remember on that first slide, I had mentioned that there was a temporary emergency broadband benefit created with pandemic funding that is gonna be transitioned into this new permanent program and that is taking place right now. Um, the final rules will be issued this month. So this will provide a subsidy to consumers to go towards their broadband subscriptions up to $30 a month. 
So reduced from the current emergency benefit of $50 a month, there's money that can go towards the purchase of a connected device. The income eligibility has been increased. Um, and there's just, I've included some other information that may be helpful, um, kind of just uh, alerting folks to what, what funding sources are available to them. When you say current lifeline, you're talking about telephone lifeline? Uh, I am talking about the telephone lifeline, which was modernized to not be just voice, but also include broadband. Okay. Right. And there's the federal lifeline program, which is modernized, which does include broadband. So you can use the lifeline, which I think is about $9.25 a month um, towards voice service or towards broadband subscription. Um, but there is also the Vermont Lifeline program. And that is specifically for voice. There was a goal at the federal level to phase out the federal voice subsidy. And so Vermont wanted to make sure there was still a voice subsidy available. So they were very clear, I think it was in 2016 when all of this kind of modernization of the Lifeline program was taking place that there would still be a voice benefit available in the state. And I think it's like $4, four plus dollars. Um, so federal and state Lifeline programs, you did create a broadband, temporary broadband Lifeline program with CRF funds. I don't know what the status is of that funding, um, which has, I believe, since ended with the deadline. Um, but that may, might be helpful to learn a little bit more about what the uptake was and what the need was there, and then who will avail themselves of the new permanent grant of, you know, like I said, up to $30 a month. Um, and I just included some of the FCC. It's the Federal Communications Commission that is, uh, administering this subsidy. And I included some of the orders there that talk mostly about the transitioning from one program to another. So not really related to broadband funding, there are some other provisions that I just think are interesting to be aware of in the Infrastructure Act related to consumer protection generally. Um, the FCC will be adopting rules regarding a consumer broadband label. So this would be um, information about a broadband service, what the speeds are, what the price is, making sure that consumers understand what they're signing up for. So if there are teaser rates, you know, what the final rate will be, um, what is the minimum level service that they're going to actually receive, um, not just the advertised service. Um, this is something that the FCC is now working on. In addition, obviously speed, broadband speeds is um, significant in terms of how we define what the need is um, for households and who is eligible for funding. So what those thresholds should be. So there's, and there's been a lot of debate. So obviously Vermont, you've defined a threshold of 100, 100. Um, right now the FCC, although the programs fund more um, than what their current speed is, which is 25.3, it's still less than um, for the most part, what you define as, you know, kind of the necessary threshold or what you're, you want to invest your public dollars in. But any, in any event, there is a report that's looking at what the speeds should be. And that report is due in a year. They're also looking at um, what's called digital redlining. Um, basically, if providers um, in some way do not build out to areas based on income, race, ethnicity, or don't offer their services. This is another topic that has um, gained some um, concern and interest. So that's something that will be looked at over the next two years by the FCC. And then also 
um, the federal universal service fund. Um, you know, you have a Vermont universal service fund, right? That's that surcharge of 2.4% on your telecom bill, retail telecom bill. There's also a federal surcharge on interstate bills, um, communications, and that has been a source for years of debate about, um, right now it's just on telecommunications, not broadband service. And so there's been a big uh, discussion about whether it should be expanded and what should the money go for, you know, whether any of those existing programs that it funds should be changed. Anyway, this is just, I wanted it to be on your radar that this is something that is also being looked at more closely. And then in terms of just final thoughts that I had kind of wrapping all of this up, I wanted to remind you of something you said last year in the big bill. Um, you mm -hmm. said that between ARPA funds and other federal and state funds, the General Assembly anticipates spending $250 million for broadband development over the next three years. You have a state statutory goal of delivering 100 symmetrical service to all locations in Vermont by the end of 2024. And in terms of some kind of relevant data that's in the most recent Vermont 10-year telecom plan, which was published this summer, approximately 51,000 locations in Vermont lack 25-3 service, so they're considered unserved. And in that plan, um, and you can hear more from the department about this because I know there's a lot of uh, variables with the cost estimate, but in the plan, I believe it specifies that it would cost between 362 million and 439 million to bring those 51,000 locations up to 100 symmetrical service. And then there are 185,000 locations that have less than 100 symmetrical service, but more is than- Is that 20. additive or is the 51,000 part of the 185? Uh, I believe it is additive. So these are people that have above the 25-3. So it would not include the 50, so it's not additive. It would not include- No, it wouldn't be, okay. Those who don't have it and those who have a little. Right. Okay. And so that, is all that I have for you today. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell yes, us how Senator many locations there are in Vermont? So I, I'd like to judge what percentage don't even have 25 or under and what percentage have a, between 25 and 100. Yes, and actually, um, that's I mean, probably in the plan. Thousand people, but I don't know how many locations. It is definitely in the plan. I'm just looking. I want to make sure. It's I, also in our broadband issue brief. We can we can send that around yes. to the committee. Yeah, that. Oh, that'd it, be would, helpful. Yeah, it'd be helpful mm -hmm. if we could get just where are we? Mm -hmm. So, are you telling us that? I'm sorry, I should have raised my hand. No, let's go right ahead, Sarah Sears. I, is what you're saying is that. It's going to cost three hundred and sixty-five million, and we've only allocated about two sixty-five. So we haven't even allocated enough money to do the job. Is that so? Here is the thing, and this is why I might check in with the department. So I think there may be some assumptions that might be the total cost, but that might not be factoring in if the providers also invest. So you might not need to fund the whole amount. You might need to provide enough of an incentive to make it financially viable for providers to contribute and build out. So, but I'm, you know, I'm not so well versed in exactly how they arrived at those figures. So I don't wanna. And that may, so what you're saying is that would be the amount if the state picked up the total tab, but if the CUDs are doing financing through um, their utilities, um, and so there are multiple funding uh, strategies right. to get mm -hmm. to that uh, total financing needed. Um, the broadband board would be the best entity to give us that complete picture um, 
to follow up on what Senator Sears is asking? It's definitely the broadband board and the Department of Public Service. And I know they've been working very closely um, developing these numbers, so. Okay. All right. Um, we, we knew that the 250 wasn't going to totally do it, but we wanted to set forth a framework of allocation. Um, and um, at that point, we didn't know what additional federal funds would be available. So, the, um, um, so that's probably something that we can take a look at. Um, all right. Any Thank other you. questions of Maria? Senator Westman, did you have one? No, I, um, no. I, I was interested in how do I create a picture? Okay. And so Stephanie uh, said she'll send out the issue brief. That's um, And, and um, Joint Fiscal did a number of issue briefs for, um, for the legislators because it's really hard to um, uh, keep all the different funding streams um, straight and sort of a baseline. So uh, we're getting them on, there'll be one for housing, there's one for broadband, uh, there's, oh, I think a total of five, was it, Stephanie? Um, yeah, yes, there are five of them, housing, broadband, water, economic development, and climate. Okay. Okay. Other questions of Maria? It says, hard to imagine this is our first day back and we're already rattling these numbers around. Alice, you all set? Okay. Bobby, you all? Um, I just, you know, I do want to pick up on the meeting that we had, because I believe you attended that one with the public utilities. Yeah. And I think, and I think they had one in the Morrisville area, Rich. So I don't yeah, they did have one in the Morrisville area. Okay. I had one with uh, Orleans and those guys, yeah, and then you had one down in Lamoille County. Yeah, because yeah. in our area also. You did, okay. So um, Maria, thank you for making a connection with Melissa just to see if there's um, some opportunities there um, since it was, a, you know, they wanted to brief legislators in uh, the areas that have those um, um, mostly a municipal utilities. I mean, it was Hardwick, Linden, it was all, Bell. It was all the municipal. All, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was their organization. Yeah. And what, which, which we created in statute. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know when that was done, but yes, Alice. There was a web address that Mar Maria, that you had in your, um, on that slide that had the number on it with regard to this, this issue of the grants, which was there briefly, but then disappeared. I don't know if that's, I don't have that slide, but. I'm sorry, which, for which one? For the one where we were asking about the grants for the municipals that Jane had asked about. Oh, oh. Um, well, if, if Maria's gonna give that directly to Melissa, then she's taking care of it for us. Okay, that'd be great. But it's so it's Title 42 of the United States Code and it's Section 17386. Oh, but I mean, you there actually flashed a web address there as well. Not wasn't on the slide, but it showed up a little bit later oh. under, underneath it. OK, I'm not sure. Picture of it, but there wasn't time. Well, but anyway, if you send it to, to Melissa Bailey, okay. that. Okay, I will have to Great. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Then um, it's a little after three and um, um, I'm going to suggest then we wrap it up for today and go offline. Chrissy, if you would, please. We've uh, finished our 